These videos are strictly only for entertainment and educational purposes. I do not encourage or endorse to any of the behaviors of the people I am talking about in my videos. Nathan Larson started out as a politician, running for office in Virginia hoping to make a difference in the world. But luckily he didn't win. Nathan was a racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, white supremacist, pile. Yes, you heard that right. Quite the long list and if elected he wanted to fight for men's rights. Make sure that women were property, legalize child porn and child abuse, incest and so much more. This story just gets crazier as we go, so let's get started. This is the story of Nathan Larson, the pedophile politician. Nathan Daniel Larson was born September 19, 1980 in Virginia. We honestly don't know much about his childhood, there is not that much information about it. Later in life he attended George Mason University, and he studied accounting. It was in college that he found his love for politics. He was on the school student senate representing the school of management and at this time Nathan said he was a member of the Libertarian Party. In college Nathan had an awakening at the beginning of college and he really learned who he was as a person. He thought he was better than everyone else, and he also believed that he was one of the most brilliant thinkers of our time. So he really felt like, if he doesn't share his brilliant mind with the people, the world is going to fall into despair. I say this with no exaggeration. He said that he thought he was so brilliant, and he would make such a great politician because he had this ability to think without any emotional involvement. He said he only used real facts and he could avoid the emotion that gets in the way of a good debate. He thought people were too caught up in their own selfishness, and they could not see the truth right in front of them, and he thought that the world had gotten all too soft because of the feminist movement. He believed that structured debate and everyday conversations needed to be softened for women's weak and inferior minds in order to avoid hurting some people's feelings. In order to communicate with women he believed people had stopped being factual in their debates and conversations, and instead just tried to appease other people's egos, which led to widespread social degradation. Nathan was very vocal about how the feminist movement was horrible and ruined everything and basically was the root of every problem in the world, and he passionate wanted to spread the word that if we just let white men run everything while women stay home and start making babies as young as possible, Everything in the world would just be great. In college, Nathan was pretty active in the student senate, and he made his first political headlines when he went after university's policies for the punishment of students that were caught possessing marijuana. While he was unsuccessful in his attempts to change the policies, he did get a taste of the political scene and he liked it. At this point in his life, we do know that Nathan received a couple of misdemeanor charges. One was for use of computer for harassment, which I guess was because he sent lewd emails to a woman when he was in college, and two others were for marijuana possession. In 2005, Nathan Larson really got into Wikipedia. He began very frequently editing many Wikipedia pages. His goal in doing this was to make taboo or illegal topics, including child sex abuse, culturally acceptable by editing Wikipedia pages, and he was constantly fighting and arguing against Wikipedia's child protection policy. He became such a hassle for Wikipedia that they finally banned him entirely in 2008. But he just moved on to other sites like Rational Wiki. In 2008, Nathan Larson decided he wanted to run for Congress in Virginia's first congressional district. He was running as a libertarian, and as he campaigned, he got the opportunity to debate the other two candidates. One Republican, one Democrat, and him as a third-party candidate. Nathan at this point in his political career was pushing for a limited government involvement in the public's everyday life, privatizing transportation like buses and privatizing other things like the U.S. Postal Service. At the debate, Nathan got laughed off the stage. The debate went poorly. When he was asked what he would do to help the economy, he said that he would work towards privatizing many areas of the U.S. government, which would in turn boost the economy. Also, to boost the economy, public education should be privatized and schools should be optional. Child labor laws should be abolished because kids should be able to join the workforce as early as 10 years old because some people are ready to work earlier than others. 
He claimed kids need to be prepared for the real world, and getting a few years head start into the workforce would be great for the kids and the economy. He lost the election. Nathan only got 2% of the votes. He was hoping that the debate was going to help him win over the people because he felt that if people would just listen to him, he could fix the world. His loss made him come to the conclusion that he didn't win because he hadn't gone extreme enough with his political views, he wasn't being true to himself, he had softened himself for weak and inferior minds. So he got to work planning his next run in the political game. But then, Nathan became emotionally destroyed. When in the winter of 2008, Barack Obama was elected president. Not only was Nathan Larson an anti-feminist libertarian, but he was also very racist and a white supremacist. He believed only white men should be in positions of power. So, now here he is, can't even get elected to Congress in Virginia, but America just elected the first black president. He was indeed very pissed. I'm only guessing he felt very similarly about black people as he did about women. Nathan believed that Barack Obama being elected was going to destroy the world. At this time, Nathan was 29. He was so angry about Obama getting elected that he actually wrote a letter to the U.S. Secret Service that said, I'm writing to inform you that in the near future, I will kill the President of the United States. He continued on in detail on how he would assassinate the President. I still don't know what he thought the outcome of this letter would accomplish. A couple of days later, the Secret Service showed up at his door, and they arrested him. He still stood by everything that he said in that letter. Nathan was sentenced to 16 months. Prison made things worse, Nathan got out after 14 months, and after that, all of his views became more extreme. He was even more anti-feminist, he openly made comments about how domestic abuse is a great way to women into submission. He was even more racist and was openly using racial slurs in everyday conversations. And now he began being very vocally open about being a pedophile, and frequently talked out loud about his desire to engage in sexual activity with children. After Nathan got out of prison, he had to go to court-ordered therapy as part of his probation. He went for a short time, and then after a little while, Nathan ended up sending an email to his probation officer, stating that he no longer needed group therapy and if he was forced to go, he would go on a killing spree, so. Then he just stopped going. While he was in group therapy, Nathan met Finn. Finn was a trans man who was also in Nathan's group therapy, and Finn was there to get help with depression and suicidal thoughts and self-harm. For some reason, Nathan became fixated on Finn. He started manipulating Finn and coerced Finn into a relationship. They ended up getting married. Nathan was extremely controlling of Finn, controlling what they ate, what they wore, and even when Finn was allowed to go to the bathroom. Nathan also refused to acknowledge that Finn was trans, constantly misgendering Finn. He would tell Finn that their only purpose on earth was to serve Nathan, and that Nathan's sole purpose was to be with a woman and breed. Once they were married, Nathan began regularly raping Finn telling them explicitly that Nathan's intention was to impregnate them to produce a daughter so that he could have sex with his daughter. When Finn got pregnant, something shifted. Finn felt that the baby really needed to be protected from Nathan. So Finn filed for divorce and applied for a restraining order, which was granted because Finn had tons of evidence. Like an email from Nathan that said, it didn't concern me that given my history of raping you, as well as the gravity of what I was proposing doing to the children, I might irreparably destroy our relationship and any prospect of me ever seeing the children especially unsupervised. Nathan admitted in court to emailing that and had Finn. So now that the marriage was over, Nathan had a lot of time on his hands. He started two websites that he owned and operated. The first one was for suicidal files. It was a lobby that stood for people and other sex offenders to be able to kill themselves legally at clinics. The other website was created to serve as both headquarters and casual hangout for the hardcore incels. If you're unfamiliar with the term incel, it refers to a group of people who have deemed themselves involuntarily celibate 
usually implying that feminism and female empowerment has deprived them of the sexual gratification that they deserve. Now that Nathan was divorced, he was even more anti-feminist, even more racist, even more of a pedophile, and now he considers himself part of the incel movement. He publicly admitted that his views got way more extreme after his divorce in 2015. Nathan's now 34 and moved back in with his parents, and he began working as an accountant part-time while also running his websites. Finn went on to give birth to a baby girl, but tragically, Finn ended up taking their own life, leaving the baby with Finn's parents. I'm sure Finn didn't think that this was going to happen due to the restraining order, but Nathan was informed of Finn's death and the existence of his daughter, and immediately wanted custody. In October 2016, Nathan went to Colorado Springs and met his daughter. Mind you, he is a convicted felon, against whom the other parent had a restraining order while they were alive. He vocally admits to being sexually attracted to children and even stated that he planned on sexually abusing his daughter. During court proceedings he was quoted saying that he doesn't think he would molest his own daughter, but he wasn't sure because he'd never been in that kind of situation before. He also said he believes it's okay for adults to have sexual relationships with children, as long as they have consent and that the age of consent varies from child to child because some children mature faster. He went on to say that he also believes incest is awesome, and that if he were to have a son he wouldn't be interested in engaging in such activities with him, but that he would approve of his son engaging in those activities with his sister or his mother. He also believed that pedophilia was a civil rights issue and that it should be protected under free speech. He also believes that since he's the man of the house, it should be his choice to do whatever he wants under his roof and raise his children exactly how he wants to, and the way he wants to raise his children is to have sex with them. He also thought that going to court to try and get custody of his daughter was a way to stand up for the underrepresented. In his words, the overlooked minority that is pedophiles. Luckily, the jury was disgusted by him and he was not granted custody of his daughter. The judge also said that Nathan needed to see a psychiatrist to do an assessment to see if Nathan should even be allowed in a room with any children, which Nathan replied with, Oh, I already did that a few years ago, and it was already proven that I am unsafe to be around children unsupervised, but it'd be pretty hard to raise a kid with the constant presence of a social worker, am I right? He was sent back to his parents' house, where he just got mentally worse in 2017. Nathan ran for office in Virginia again, he ran as a libertarian again, and he did not win. Then in 2018 he ran again in Virginia, this time as an independent because the Libertarian Party disavowed him. The Libertarian Party representative even said that Nathan Larson is disgusting. The issues that Nathan Larson was campaigning about were that he wants to legalize incest, make it illegal for a woman to accuse her husband of rape, and that is a sexual orientation that needs to be a protected civil right. These statements were very extreme, so the local news stations were talking about him, interviewing him. Nathan wanted to make sure everyone could view his ideas, so he made another website where he posted his campaign, called Manifesto. It states, I, Nathan Larson, hereby announce my candidacy as a quasi-neo-reactionary libertarian in Virginia's 10th Congressional District Election 2018. As representative, my main agenda will be 1. Stopping the war on drugs 2. Protecting gun ownership rights and 3. Putting an end to U.S. involvement in foreign wars arising from our country's alliance with Israel. I will also restore 4. Benevolent white supremacy 5. Private borders 6. Patriarchy 7. Freedom of speech 8. Freedom from age restrictions 9. Suicide rights 10 jury trial rights, 11, discrimination rights, and 12, free trade. He also talks about how Hitler was a hero and was actually a pretty good thing for Germany. He said that O.J. Simpson did not deserve to be locked up during his trial because his wife got what she deserved as punishment for her infidelity. He says the authority of husbands has been undermined by feminists and that he's surprised that men even get married anymore. He said that Chris Brown was able to avoid the inconvenience of having to murder Rihanna because they weren't married. He even blamed school 
warnings on the fact that so many young boys are fatherless because feminism encourages sexual promiscuity and undermined husbands' authority over their wives. He also said that, Guns don't kill people, feminists do. He also said that white supremacy is a system that works, and that he admires the Taliban, because if feminism is introduced in Afghanistan, the fertility rate will drop just like it did in the US. He said that the Violence Against Women Act should be repealed, along with all other legislation that interferes with patriarchal rule in the family, because women are, I quote, property. He also said that child pornography is an art form and possession of it should be legalized and because 90% of people prosecuted for possessing child pornography are white, which means that these laws were being used to target and persecute white America. He also said that there should be no minimum marriage age because women are fertile before 18. So this of course resulted with Nathan being laughed out of the politics game, and he withdrew from the election. He then tried to give his support to a different candidate, but he was rejected, and he said, I'd rather lose than to be endorsed by a pedophile. So Nathan left the political world for good. He was now soon to be entering his 40s still living with his parents, and he threw himself into running his various websites and posting on his social media platforms under multiple names. He was mostly using these incel or pedophilia websites to advocate for the grooming of children online educating readers on how to convince children to send you images over the internet, as in encouraging sexual performances of minors through grooming, and also about how possession of child pornography should be legal and sexual assault of children should be legal, and also that women are property. The same stuff he said prior, except worse, and now discussion of child grooming and exploitation has been added to the conversation. Talking about all of these things, Nathan realized that he wanted to do these things, so he began creating fake social media accounts using fake photos, usually putting himself between the ages of 18 and 25, and Nathan started reaching out to young girls on the internet, and so, he began grooming, which Nathan had a skill for. He was very good at quickly identifying vulnerable underage girls that he could take advantage of, he would befriend these girls and he would try to convince them to send him photos or videos of themselves. If they didn't agree to send any photos or videos, he would immediately block them or just stop contact altogether. But if they did agree, he would simply collect for his own sick pleasure. We don't know how many girls that he did this to, but in October 2020, it seems that the images alone were not enough. And eventually, Nathan, who had been talking with a 12-year-old girl from California, convinced her she should run away from home with him. He told her he would take care of everything. He started making a plan on how he could kidnap her. Nathan bought a long wig and sent it to her. He told her he was going to buy her a plane ticket. After that, get to the airport and wear the wig. He told her she had to pretend to be mentally disabled because then people won't want to talk to her. He was planning to go from Virginia to California, pick up this girl, and fly with her from California to his parents' home in Virginia. So fast forward to December 14th, she puts her wig on, goes to the airport, and meets Nathan. Some sources say he missed her right there in the airport, some say before the airport, and some say not at all. They boarded a plane to Virginia. While they were in the air, a friend of the 12-year-old girl called the police and reported that her friend had met up with an older strange man at the airport. The police acted quickly. They found evidence on her computer to track what flight she was on. The flight they were on had a connecting flight, so they landed in Denver. There they were quickly intercepted by police and the girl was reunited with her family back in California. Nathan was arrested. He was charged with attempted kidnapping, child abduction, soliciting child pornography from a minor, meeting a child with the intention of sex and harboring a minor. On February 25, 2021, Nathan pleaded not guilty to the charges and he wished to represent himself, and he wished to use the trial to bring attention to the fact that his rights as a pedophile were being taken away. In March 2022, the judge let him represent himself, but two weeks after, dismissed it, and just gave Nathan a court-appointed lawyer. Nathan was shipped off to prison in Arizona, awaiting his trial. Because the girl was a minor and Nathan was not a family member, the minimum charge that he would receive was 20 years, and the maximum charge would be life. 
Nathan didn't want to sit in prison and wait for his trial. So Nathan went on a hunger strike. He just stopped eating. And on September 18th, 2022, Nathan passed away from self-starvation. In 2023, the charges against Nathan were dropped, obviously, because he was dead. And just like that, this concludes the story of the infamous Nathan Larson. Thank you for watching this video. Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments down below. Don't forget to like the video and also subscribe for more. See you next time. Bye.